Um, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to uh, this uh, talk, uh, New College of the Humanities in conjunction with, with Res Publica. And it's, it's our uh, very, very great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Mr. David Boyton, uh, who is known to us, um, and he has given up some time. It's just coming up to, well, it's just two minutes past eight in Hong Kong, so uh, we're, we're, we're very grateful uh, for you coming along um, at uh, sort of evening time. Um, just by short introduction, I'm, I'm by no means the main sort of attraction in this at all. Um, Mr. David Boynton is, is head of uh, Pacific Chambers uh, in Hong Kong, uh, one, one of the larger sets uh, from what I could see looking, looking at uh, Hong Kong Chambers, um, has been there for, for getting on 24 years uh, as head uh, the last three years with a, a, a very broad range of uh, experiences, uh, mainly by the looks of it, sort of criminal, um, and is going to give us a talk today um, on what appears to, to bring in a whole range of extremely sort of topical uh, sort of subjects. Uh, it's something that's going to cross, uh, I would imagine, sort of jurisprudence, uh, criminal law, uh, technology, and indeed uh, some sort of very modern uh, sort of developments in terms of sort of judicial practice by the looks of it. Uh, so we're, we're uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to David with a, a sort of an expression of thanks before we start uh, and look very much forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. So thank you very much indeed. And I'll, I'll hand over to David. Thank you. I'm glad this talk is uh, going to be received by undergraduates so I do not have to repeat everything twice as I do in front of the jury and not full times when you're trying to make a point in the Court of Appeal. Now what I would like to do is to take you away from your books, take you away from the classroom and your lecture halls to consider some practical problems with the law, particularly the common law. I know because of the pandemic you probably have not seen the inside of the lecture hall for some time. Anyway, let's see. Now, the common law has been defined, defined or described as the law of England from ancient times. Hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will each ask yourselves in practical terms, can we still apply the common law to a developing modern society which is reliant or revolves around our ever advancing technology. I tried to make that question devoid of any moral consideration and will illustrate with the nearly universal use of the motor car. So in the 19th and 20th century, we had the increased use of the motor car and parliament passed various road traffic acts to regulate the use of these vehicles. And such legislation must only come into effect after lengthy consultation with the public and after detailed recommendations by various pressure groups, royal commissions and law reform commissions. I actually thought to myself, how were motor cars regulated before the Road Traffic Act of 1988? And admittedly, I had to look that up. Now, the act of the first uh, act I could find was the Locomotives on Highways Act 1896. And that itself shows you the quantum leap in the technology of the time. You have locomotives, that's trains, on roads. And that act was subsequently uh, amended by the Motor Car Act of 1903, 100 years ago, and we can all have a laugh because that act increased the speed limit for motor cars from four miles an hour in rural areas and two miles an hour in towns to 14 miles an hour. Now, these acts are all statute based, they all pass by Parliament, and the matter of licensing and driving cars has no moral issue. So I'd 
having given you that introduction, I would like to turn to the crux of this talk. What happens when there is an urgent social or moral problem and the parliamentary legislation has not yet been enacted to deal with that problem? Does the common law step in to fill the gap? Or could you ask, should the common law step in to fill that gap? You have learned at university that under the common law, you are entitled to do anything you wish. That is, unless there is a law against it. So with the recent explosion of computers, mobile telephones, mobile phones with cameras, we have a modern phenomena of individuals taking unwanted photographs of strangers and coupled with that a surge in what is known as upskirt photo taking. This is both an invasion of someone's privacy and a civil wrong. However, as I mentioned earlier, without any specific legislation, it is or may not be a crime. We must ask ourselves, is taking an unwarranted picture morally wrong? Should the laws, the criminal courts, deal with these acts as crimes? When, at the time of the act, there was no such legislation? The acts of taking upskirt photographs are what we now describe as voyeurism. If we accept that the origins of the common law start from around the Norman Conquest in 1066, then the problem of voyeurism has been around long, a long time, a long time before the English common law. The book of Daniel in the Bible records the story of Susanna and the elders. The story involves Susanna, who is bathing in a garden and is observed by two lecherous men. And the description that they are lecherous in, in Daniel's writings would suggest, it indicates that they are doing something morally wrong. And that was written in the third century AD. Now, in, according to the story, the elders then tried to blackmail Susanna into having sex and having failed, made up a story which resulted in Susanna being arrested and condemned to death by a court of law. In something resembling a courtroom drama from television, Daniel, however, saves the day and demands a fair trial. The elders are separated and cross-examined separately. They are found to be liars because, according to the story, they could not get their story straight and tell the court which tree Susanna was actually under when she committed the crime. The two men were then executed. What was the moral of the story? You may think that the act of voyeurism is only mentioned in passing or a mere subplot for the reader. Then moving on to just before 1066, you have the story of the Anglo-Saxon queen, Lady Godiva, who promised to ride through a town naked and everyone undertook and contracted with her not to look. Of course, we know now that Thomas looked, and in the legend, because he did that, he looked at Lady Godiva's naked body, he was struck down dead. Thereafter, we have in the English language, the description of a voira as a peeping Tom. That was before 1066, 1066, and up to the last decade, there is no legislation and no well-known common law decisions dealing with the issue of voyeurism. Ask yourselves, was Peeping Tom's conduct morally wrong? The lesson of the story involves him being struck down dead. Notice that I did not ask, was the moral of this, what was the moral of the story? Was the true wrong of the elders to give false evidence in a trial? Was the true wrong of peeping Tom to break the contract with Lady Godiva not to peep? So voyeurism was not really dealt with in any great detail. They, it was an existing problem centuries ago, but not dealt with in the stories. So moving on to the 20th century, should the criminal law deal with this type of voyeuristic conduct? 
can the criminal law deal with that sort of conduct? If the entire basis of the common law was and is based on the coincidence of the actus reus and the mens rea, was there potentially a criminal act? Using the language of the 14th century, P.P. and Tom certainly had a lecherous and wanton mind, and this, I would suggest, had constituted his mens rea. But was the act of simply staring at Lady Godiva, or even with one version of the story, adjusting his horse blinkers or blinders to look at Lady Godiva, sufficient to deem his actus rea? Probably not. And unlike your criminal law examinations, there is no real correct answer. Perhaps this failure to legislate or even to be widely condemned by society can be elicited from the ancient Greek pottery dating back to the fifth century BC. Some of the pottery depicts acts of voyeurism, which many scholars have suggested that the society at the time encouraged the maxim, you can watch, but you cannot touch. So, is it right that after a thousand years, the common law since 1066 has now been overtaken by modern technology? Or does the modern criminal law have to specifically catch up with and deal with the universal use of the computer and the internet? Something which has allowed individuals to commit new crimes quicker and in more sophisticated ways. New laws made by parliament black and white letter law have been introduced to deal with the protection of copyright, control of obscene and indecent materials, including child pornography and gambling to name but a few. Ask yourselves this, is the black and white legislative law a simple matter of addressing technological developments? Since the second world war, there has been a quantum leap as regards human rights and most significantly, the status of women in society. So has our morality moved away from the position 2,500 years ago? And we now no longer follow the maxim, you can look, but you cannot touch. I think in relation to voyeurism, the consensus of our modern society would be extremely critical of such overt and deliberate acts that degrade or debase women, and for that matter, any individual or human being. This is, of course, everybody except Tony, sorry, Christopher Chop, the Tory MP who objected to the private members bill to introduce legislation to criminalize moralism. Now, after such a lengthy introduction, I would now turn to the crux of the talk. How did the lower courts impose their own moral standards and criminalize the act of upskirt photo photography. Talk is now slightly outdated as parliaments in most common law jurisdictions have since enacted legislation to make such acts and such conduct illegal. In America, 2014, a lawyer named Michael Robertson from Massachusetts took an upskirt photograph of another commuter on a train. He was convicted by a low court, but his conviction then quashed by the Massachusetts Supreme Court because, well, the victim was not naked. The state governor then introduced legislation within two days to cover that aspect of the law. This, I would suggest to you, is a typical example of the low courts applying its own morality to the case against the black letter law. It is also interesting to note that the local newspapers in Massachusetts called it a loophole in the law. This loophole, as you have just been told, was corrected by the legislature. Now, in Hong Kong, the low courts have used a number of existing offences to deal with the problem of upskirt photography, including, firstly, loitering. This is an English offence to deal with vagrancy and homelessness. The non-legal and common definition is the act of remaining in a particular public place for a 
protracted time without any apparent purpose. Now, after a number of convictions, I would say unlawful convictions, the higher courts quite correctly prevented this practice and loitering therefore did not apply to upskirting. Next came the prosecution of upskirting acts by using the offence of disorderly conduct. This involves, according to the definition, the intentional disturbing of the public peace by language or conduct. And the intellectual dishonesty to achieve these convictions led to an assumption that if someone had seen the act, that imaginary individual would have been so outraged that he himself would have caused a breach of the peace, namely punch the person who was taking the photograph. Again, this was wrong in law and struck down by the high courts as being inappropriate for upskirting. The lower courts were then quite happy to convict upskirt photographing with the offence of accessing a computer with criminal or dishonest intent. This was an offence legislated by Parliament. The prosecution under this offence led to a single High Court judge accepting on a magistracy appeal, similar to your Queen Bench appeals, that a smartphone was a computer. But you can see by this example that the lower courts were willing to completely bend the law to impose a conviction. I personally do not see how the taking of a photograph is dishonest. I would have said the dishonest element defined in the Theft Act as a gain for himself or another, or with intent to cause loss to another, should only relate to financial matters rather than intangible things. But in the end, the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal, that's the highest court here, the second appellate court, struck down the application of this offence, not because of an appeal by any defendant who took an up pho upskirt photograph, but by someone taking photographs of secret examination questions, using a mobile phone and passing the questions on. I think it's sad because the lower courts have taken the wrong path, reaffirmed its erroneous decisions and caused countless wrongful convictions for years. The danger has been to build up a line of erroneous jurisprudence, which was self-perpetuating, so that no one who was charged with this offence in relation to upskirting would actually appeal that point. Anyway, the Hong Kong Court Final Appeal held that, like every other jurisdiction uses, using this statute, that an individual could not commit this crime if he was using his own computer and the dishonesty related to entering someone else's computer. It is also sad from my point of view that prior to the decision of the Hong Kong Court of the Final Appeal, there was over 10 years earlier already a law reform commission in place that had made recommendations to introduce the offence of voyeurism, covering the very point of upskirt photography. So there was 10 years of inactivity and not following recommendation. The act, the act of upskirt photography is still being prosecuted in England and Wales and in the Hong Kong jurisdiction by using a common law offence of outraging public decency. And so far, it's still good law. And you will know from the English case of the Queen and Hamilton in 2007 that the court in English, England and Wales have dispensed with the old law that is no longer necessary to have a witness observe the act in a public place. Thereby, the law effectively accepts what I would describe as a test of fiction. The House of Lords, however, disagree with me and say the definition is within the offence. Now, these are my views of what I have described as judicial meddling at the lower courts. Taking our jurisprudence down the wrong path, but the common law system is an adversarial 
uh, system. There is always an opposing view. And in concluding this talk, I'd like to remind you of the famous cases of the Director of Public Pr Prosecutions and Shaw, that was in 1962, and Muller and the DPP, that was decided in 1973, where the English courts invented the offence of cons conspiracy to corrupt public morals. And those two cases illustrate the fact that the courts themselves say that where they have a duty to protect society's morality, they have a duty to enforce it and enforce their own decisions. Now, I would like to quote from Lord Simmons' speech in Nuller and the DPP, remembering uh, that this was in the early 1970s. Can I read it to you now? The common law proceeds generally by distilling from a particular case the legal principle on which it is decided. And that legal principle is then generally applied to circumstances of other cases, to which the principle is relevant as they arise before the courts. As Park B said, give them the advice of the judges to your Lordship's house in Mearhouse and Renan. Our common law system consists in applying to new combinations of circumstances, these rules of law, which we derive from legal principles and judicial precedents. And for the sake of attaining uniformity, consistency and certainty, we must apply those rules where they are not plainly unreasonable or inconvenient to all cases which arise and we are not at liberty to reject them and to abandon all analogy to them in those to which they have not yet been judicially applied because we think that the rules are not as convenient and reasonable as we ourselves could have devised. Now, I cannot leave it there. Shaw was decided in 1960 and Nuller was decided in 1973. Nuller's case involved the publication of an article that invited readers to meet other homosexuals. How would that case be decided today? And you cannot turn the clock back to 1918 with the case of Thompson and the King, where the House of Lords held that there was real probative value to say a man was a homosexual because he was carrying powder puffs. To make the statement today is both wrong in law and morally wrong. Now, thank you um, both Res Publica and New College of Humanities for hosting me today. Uh, I hope this uh, will raise some debate and questions. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll dive in. Thank you so much for this really, really uh, interesting uh, talk, uh, David, if I can call you by your first oh. name, please. Um, I am probably the most likely that teaches in this area, and uh, I can see Gaetan uh, Ferry, one of my first year students, who will confirm that in the last seminar, we actually uh, covered Shaw and, uh, as I call him, Knüller, because he was actually originally German. So uh, I'm, I'm expecting Gaetan uh, to comment on this. Uh, I've got so many questions and, and comments on this, David. Thank you uh, for your inspiring talk. Uh, whilst you were um, uh, whilst you were talking about this, I looked up the new voyeurism offences, uh, which um, I don't know whether you know, but I have been a magistrate for a long, long time. And so it's the magistrates courts that initially deal uh, with, with these kind of offences. And indeed, uh, I was consulted um, around about uh, 2017 when upskirting first came before the courts and the courts had real problems in, um, in, in dealing with this. We now have uh, the new, two new offenses uh, which are, uh, have been incorporated under section 67A, one and two, and section 68 of the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. Now, uh, your own daughter, Tabby, will know this because she's currently studying sexual offences here, but I doubt 
uh, whether they've gone way down uh, to the section 6, 67 and 68. Um, so indeed, we've got voyeurism, what it is indeed, and section 67A1 goes actually further than just digital cameras. Uh, it mentions phones, video cameras, and other equipment. So you can cover other equipment. But uh, and section 68 explains exactly what voyeurism is. And I, I found it interesting. It only relates to women. So it's, it's um, section 67A uh, is, is very descriptive as the whole Sexual Offences Act indeed is genitals, buttocks, um, and so on. It's very, very descriptive. And um, you did mention the, the case of, of Knüller, Knüller uh, dealing with homosexuality. And it, it occurred to me, men are clearly completely left out of this. It, it is specifically towards women. Um, and, and then my mind went further to Scotland, where men wear skirts. Uh, I don't know whether you've thought about this, the so-called kilt. And it's, I cannot confirm this, although I have lived, lived for four years in Glasgow. What if someone was on an escalator, say a, a female now, to upskirt a man in a kilt, um, reportedly not wearing anything under the kilt, I couldn't possibly comment. W how would the law deal with that? Well, Queen and Hamilton is still good law, and so I believe the correct offence will be outraging public decency. Uh, the, the new legislation also includes, I believe, uh, photography in private premises rather than public place. Is that right? That so is that, right. Yeah, that's that's unusual. I thought. It, I think all, uh, the law, all the law before was in public places. Yeah. Can can I move on? Unless someone else has got something to say. Okay, I'll I'll move on from from that one. Now let's go. How you started? You started about uh, the law, and I call it the law. AI and the law, which again falls very much within my research remit now, A AI and the law, and is the common law, is the law law still adequate for new type uh, of offences? And you mentioned the Road Traffic Act, which I am very familiar with, 1988, because most of the magistrates motoring matters happens under the Road Traffic Act, 1988. And in the same year, the Copyright and Design and Patents Act, 1988, was also passed. These are two, what we now call ancient acts, but the courts will have to deal with this all the time. So what about, and you touched on this. Um, so section one of the Road Traffic Act, uh, which deals with causing death, death by dangerous driving. And then we've got section two, A1 of the RTA uh, is careless driving. So how do we apply that to self-driven cars now? That, that is something that uh, I'm thinking about, I wow. read about. Uh, so that's one for you to think about. And the other one, which again touches on uh, the area that I, I write about in my books, which is section one uh, of the uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, requires that literary, dramatic, musical or artistic works are original and have to be authored by a human being uh, using, uh, which is old case law, his or her sweat of the brow. Now, uh, we are increasingly uh, getting musical works uh, done by a robotic computer, which are now performed and authored in the style of the Beatles. Or we have paintings being originated now in the style of Rembrandt. Where do we go then with we cannot afford copyright to that robot, and therefore we cannot afford any royalties to that computer either. This is something that lawyers are currently engaged in. And you know, coming back, are the laws, the night these two 1988 acts still fit for purpose? Comment. Yes, and can you prosecute the, uh, the robot for a self-induced self? made uh, painting or music 
if it's so similar to an existing exactly so we're now talking about breach of copyright i.e you know taking plagiarizing and and uh, you know taking that away in the style of no we can't yes. we can't prosecute so how far do we go in terms of where is that human in self-driven cars well i, I think the the answer is uh, as i hinted just now law reform commissions are taking far too long uh, maybe we have to go down subsidy legislation and not even the parliament parliament leaves it to a, a minor body and the minor body passes law quickly but the as you know and my students all know that yeah. uh, subordinate secondary legislation is now made in by ministers in in their chambers yes yes right, you know, yes. it hardly hardly passes through parliament so again, you know, you're finding, I'm finding myself in the courts, certainly sentencing guidelines, um, cannabis uh, was briefly a class C drug. And then I, I, I returned after a holiday and suddenly I found someone being charged with possession of cannabis. And I said to, you know, I said, why, what, why is this person here? And they said, Mad madam, don't you know, cannabis is now a class B drug. And I thought, well, how did this happen? So, you know, this is another topic, of course, secondary well, legislation. It was a political decision, wasn't it? It was a political decision when the recommendation was to uh, decriminalize it. The uh, politicians made it more serious. <laughs> they did. OK, I, I leave the floor to someone else. I've said too much already. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Oh, Tim. Don't be shy. Uh, shall I fill, and, and yes. then if, if there's any others, um, I, I'm not going to be quite as taxing as, as Ursula. Um, it's, it's, I, I guess, sort of more of a, an inquiry uh, into your sort of frustrations, and a, I, I can absolutely understand your sort of frustrations um, in, in, in terms of how the law sort of develops, but I wonder if your, your views might change if if you were on the bench, uh, and, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm going to be a real sycophant. Maybe you'll be on the bench uh, uh, in, in, in years to come. But I, one of the things that really struck me, uh, and I, I've you know, told to the many students this, was, was going to a talk by Lord Newberger um, just after he had, he had sort of retired. And <laughs> It was about the art of judging, and is is you know, put put distilled very simply. He said, you know, our principal duty is to deliver justice. We work out what we're going to do, and then we kind of fudge our, our sort of working out um, therein after. And and for me, that was really nice to hear because I think, like every law student, I've sat and pondered over judgments wondered how on earth we'd gone from here to here and it was really refreshing to hear somebody from the supreme court sort of say here we go um so i, I my, my sort of question based on that is is from your experience you know on the ground you know, how big is the problem what is the tension obviously there are these you know systems in place to reform law that everywhere well, not everywhere, everywhere across the common law world seem to be entrenched in a degree of inertia. Well, the common law is very expensive. As a defendant, it's very expensive. And uh, to go up higher the chain to appeal a case would cost you a lot of money unless you get legal aid. Uh, and it's a matter of luck if you get good lawyers. So it's, oh, yes, you've got a good ground here. Uh, if you have an ordinary lawyer who's uh, an old hack, uh, working on legal aid panel, he, he might not uh, see the point. But there are two levels of appeals. There's the first appellate level. And I believe once you get to that stage, they're looking at, at the merits. Well, have you done it right? Or have you, has the magistrate or has the judge got the right decision? I, I believe that's even at the court of appeal level. Uh, yeah, he, he might have got this wrong, let's apply the proviso, but I think this man is guilty of something. 
But then when you get to the Supreme Court, the second appellate level, then you're really looking at the, the law. And the, the court is really interpreting the law. Uh, and every, every so often, the law is changed in a dramatic way, like uh, Jovi, uh, as regards to joint enterprise. Um, that uh, before that was the Privy Council case of Chan, and that went down the road for about 1970s, for about 40 years, uh, and, and all of a sudden, the law changes for some reason, uh, and it's because uh, some boy uh, had uh, had a disability, I believe. Jody had a disability, and the law changed uh, to suit him. Similarly, uh, with criminal damage, uh, reason, the reasonableness test uh, was also changed because uh, a person with disability. I, I, I think it's a matter of society changing and be, becoming more, uh, more liberal towards the individual and his thoughts, and the law is changing with society and the law is changing with attitude. So that, that's what I think. If that makes sense. Julia has a question as well. Hi, I'm an ex NCH student and also Tabby's friend. Um, uh, I didn't study law, so go easy on me. Um, <laughs> so I uh, work and have worked in startups a lot. And one of the questions that kind of comes up most frequently is, uh, you know, most startups are bootstrapped or self funded before they become VC backed. Um, so in the case where you're developing a high spec tech product, um, how do you safeguard yourself from large organizations when you don't have the financial means to patent your algorithm, for example, or to protect what it is you're building at the moment um, when someone like, I don't know, McKinsey with their quantum black lab could quickly, you know, take the idea and force it off to four of their developers and two designers? Well, I have no idea about patent laws, but I believe as soon as you register it, which you can't afford, uh, it becomes yours. But as soon as you develop something new uh, and it's completely different from somebody else, uh, then and you use it, I believe you have a patent, don't you? I, I don't know if with, I don't know, I don't know the answer, sorry. No, it's fine, it was just a, a shot. Is, sorry, David, this is, this is currently really under debate because of Brexit. Yes. And um, this is a really difficult question because the, um, the automatic patents uh, and trademarks as well, the branding uh, will change um, any minute. Now, I actually did cease to exist under EU law because all this is covered really under EU and EU law. And since Britain is outside that now, um, I'm reading a lot about this. I'm supposed to be writing about this, but I can't write about it at the moment to answer it. Was it Julia's uh, question? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not that easy anymore. Uh, she needs, Julia, you need to get in, look at the website, the IPO, the Intellectual Property Office for the United Kingdom. And that's, it's very user friendly. And that's where you need to get on uh, with your startup. And they will give you the current law as is, which is currently still EU law as David describes it, but it's going to become extremely British and therefore your work could basically be very easily stolen because we, we can't really register it. So IPO, Intellectual Property Office, the government organization, have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. David, could I be quite um, a bit more controversial than previously? Um, I, I would like to know how the law, the common law still functions in Hong Kong. Well, it's uh, safeguarded by uh, the reunification ordinance and the basic law. So it's still functioning. Um, but I think the changes in the common law are more pronounced in England than they are in Hong Kong, because you're changing basic common law principles quicker than Hong Kong. Uh, for instance, in hearsay, you're allowed hearsay in criminal laws. We, we still don't do that. We still got the old judges' rules from the 1960s. Uh, you're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so. Uh, and the right of silence here is paramount. Whereas in the UK, you have a, a new caution. Uh, you're, uh, if you withhold saying anything, that may be used against you. So I think 
uh, from the in the criminal courts, our rights are protected better on paper than they are in the UK. So the common law is still functioning well and perhaps a little bit outdated um, in that you have in UK have made inroads um, to swing back to help the prosecution rather than the individual. Whereas here, uh, every appeal uh, will be successful if uh, you comment on somebody's right to silence. Uh, you're probably referring to the case of Horn Castle, which um, does now allow hearsay in certain criminal cases when either the witnesses are dead mm. or uh, they are so afraid in very serious criminal cases that they will not come to court to give evidence. Well, that was also the Criminal Justice Act of 1988, Section 23, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, um, so th that's interesting. Uh, so, uh, so you don't, Hong Kong common law doesn't take in some of the new um, kind of criminal practice rules. Is it because of the Human Rights Act 1998 and the strong, as, as you said much earlier, you said there was a strong influence of the European Convention and the human no, rights. Why, why think, would you say that? I, I think we, we took most of the criminal law, lock, stock and barrel from uh, UK. Uh, most of the statutes like the Theft Act in 1968, we have enacted completely, uh, but since, about 1997, I think the Law Reform Commissions, who examine hearsay in criminal uh, proceedings, just take too long. I, I, I think in the last 20 years, they've had two Law Reform Commissions without, uh, although they made the recommendations to get rid of the hearsay in criminal proceedings, it's still not been enacted. It's just, it's just like voyeurism, 10 years and nothing's done. So who decides that on behalf of Hong Kong then? And how, and I would like to go further, how much more influenced are you now uh, by a Chinese law? I, I don't know. Uh, no, Hong Kong is unique. It's independent in relation to uh, the criminal law at the moment. Uh, are we still relying on statute, which is not imposed by China. Uh, and it's a very strange thing. We're still using common law from uh, the Norman conquest. So champery, uh, suing somebody uh, for the sake of suing somebody for their, their money is still law here. I believe it's been repealed in England. So how does it work if in Hong Kong, uh, someone commits a criminal offense? Who decides what law they're charged under? Is there an independent prosecution authority? Uh, there is. Uh, it depends on the nature of the offence. If it's a minor matter, the police will decide on whether or not to prosecute uh, and uh, what, what section. There is a Department of Justice here, uh, which is just like your CPS. They will decide what offences to charge. And I think legal aid here is a lot better than UK. There's a lot more funding. Uh, but also, unlike UK, uh, there is, uh, we have a legal aid for sort of your crown courts and the more serious appeals. But there is a separate body called the Duty Lawyer Service, which gives representation to everybody at the magistrate's court who are charged with a criminal offence. Yeah, that, that's unbelievable because um, as, as my students know, uh, you know, we've had the Lord Wolf reforms and in, you know, and then again, the Jackson report yes. and reforms and then the LASPO Act of 2013. Mm -hmm. Really, since 2013, you don't get legal aid for any summary offences and even now for either way offences. And I mean, my first year students are, are just writing essays about this and I know Tabby's class did as well. 
the access to justice for all, including criminal legal aid, is very, very difficult to get now because simply the state hasn't got any money. It's not a bottomless pit. And I would think post COVID now, um, it'll be even further reduced. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Thank you, but I don't want to hog the floor. Surely people have got... Yes. Um... Unfortunately, I think David has to go at 10 too. So I think we'll we'll wrap up if that's all right. Is there, if there's any other super pressing questions that need to come in very urgently? Otherwise I will conclude the, the session if that's all right. Thank Anybody? you everybody for attending. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, just first of all, I'd like to ask anybody who's able to turn on their cameras just to give a little round of applause.